So al although we did a broadcast in March 2011 that talked about project files and administrative records, and that of course can be found in the Knowledge Resource Center website, and although we touched on the administrative record and project files on the previous two contracting broadcasts, today Molly is going to get into more detail on the contracting aspects of project files and administrative record. Molly? Thanks, Kathy. So although we're covering administrative record in this broadcast, which is dedicated to contract closeout, we don't want to imply that records management can wait until the end of your contract process. So if you recall from the first two broadcasts, we've highlighted the steps along the way where you should be considering administrative record management in your contracted projects. In the first broadcast, we suggested looking for unique approaches to records management in proposals from potential contractors and then spelling out the BLM's requirements on this point explicitly in the statement of work. In the second broadcast, we provided suggestions on how to manage the task of compiling a record, like periodically checking in on the record's development or listing one primary point of contact for record management. Now when we use contractors for land use planning and NEPA efforts, the majority of records are on a day-to-day -day basis handled, if not even generated, by the contractor. It's the sum of these records. The sum of those records is used in the BLM's reaching a decision on a project and ultimately become the BLM's project record or decision file, and in the case of appeal or litigation before the Interior Board of Land Appeals, IBLA, or a court, it becomes our administrative record. We won't go into great detail about what needs to go into an administrative record or how to develop or structure the administrative record on this broadcast, um, but for specific details on what needs to be contained in the record, refer to that March 2011 broadcast that Kathy just mentioned. It's posted on the KRC page. Additional guidance on what needs to be contained in the record can also be found in the BLM's NEPA handbook or on the NEPA web guide. For many offices, the terms project record, decision file, project file, administrative record, and case file are used interchangeably. For our purposes today, we're going to define and differentiate those terms as follows. Case files. Think of the case file as an activity log on a particular case or application. Case files document the actions, the transactions, and or the activity occurring on a particular request. For example, noting that an applicant's application or payment has been received or processed. Case files don't necessarily contain resource or issue-specific information considered in a decision on an action, although they certainly could. The content of a case file is determined by program-specific BLM guidance and will differ depending on the type of matter or case. We won't spend too much more time on case files today. Project records or decision files. Now this is really the heart of our discussion today. The project record or decision file is the contemporaneous record or body of evidence supporting the rationale behind a decision maker's decision. Basically, it's our blueprint for a decision or our roadmap to a decision. Project records should be maintained for all decisions that the BLM makes. The project record should contain the complete story of the BLM's decision making process including any options considered and rejected by the BLM. It should include relevant and substantive information that was presented to, relied upon, or just reasonably available to the decision maker at the time the decision was made. It should also establish that the BLM complied with all relevant statutory, regulatory, and agency requirements. And it should demonstrate that the BLM followed a reasoned decision making process. Now many offices refer to this as their administrative record or project record or decision file, and that's fine. The differences are subtle. Today, however, we're going to refer to this as the project record because there is a difference, although subtle, between a project record as we've just described and a true administrative record for judicial review. So let's take a look at that difference. In litigation under the Administrative Procedure Act, or APA, or in appeals before the IBLA, the full project record, as we've just described, is used to create an administrative record for judicial or administrative law judge review. In many cases, the project record and the administrative record are identical. However, they may vary depending on the project or the specific lawsuit. 
work with your solicitor's office to determine what records exactly need to be included in the administrative record, as other guidelines and implementing guidance may factor into what goes into the final record. In certain limited IBLA circumstances, staff may be called in to hearings or pre-hearing conferences. But APA, Administrative Procedure Act litigation, is based solely on the record. So unlike many legal proceedings, it does not present an opportunity to call in and question actual witnesses to ascertain what occurred or what factors influenced a decision. In APA litigation, the administrative record is the only witness. For more information on how project records and administrative records are related, as well as on how they differ, check out the 2006 memo from the Office of the Solicitor in Washington. It's titled Standardized Guidance on Compiling a Decision File and Administrative Record, and we've posted it on the KRC page for your reference. So Molly, I'd like to recap the definitions and see if I got them right. Okay, so a case file is basically the activity log for a project. Mm -hmm. A project file, a project record or decision file is the evidence supporting a decision. And the admin record is, supports the judicial review and that might serve as the lone witness in a litigation. Correct. Okay. All right. Well, I would like to move on and talk a little bit more about roles. So what can you tell us about the roles of the contractor, the solicitor's office, and your local BLM office in compiling project records for NEPA documents that are contracted? Well, by nature of their role in a project, the contractor is typically the entity closest to the individual records, the emails, the reports, the meeting minutes, and other federal records, et cetera. The contractor's roles and responsibilities in developing, maintaining, and delivering the project record include, but aren't limited to, developing a schema or specific categories for indexing the record, identifying an internal strategy for managing and maintaining incoming records, gathering, generating, and, and cataloging individual records and record materials, maintaining the record, both the body of the record as well as the record's index, compiling the record, and finally producing and delivering the final record to BLM. And as we've discussed numerous times, the BLM <laughs> assumes ultimate responsibility for the administrative record prepared by the contractor. The BLM's roles include establishing and communicating our expectations for the record, ensuring that the record is in fact being maintained throughout the life of the project versus being prepared in a mad scramble either right before or right after a decision is signed, ensuring that our internally generated records, such as minutes from ID team meetings or any internal correspondence, make it into the record, ensuring that the record is substantially complete before a decision is signed, and in appeal or litigation scenarios, certifying a true and correct copy of the administrative record. In litigation or appeal scenarios where the BLM is compiling an administrative record for the court or IBLA's review, the solicitor's office <coughs> can assist with organizing the administrative record. The solicitor's office will often review records to see if they need to assert any privileges. And if necessary, the solicitor's office will also negotiate those privileges with any Department of Justice attorneys involved. The solicitor's office can be consulted regarding documents that may be questionably relevant to the record. Now because the administrative record is filed with the IBLA or the court, the solicitors or our Department of Justice attorneys must be comfortable with the document, documents that are included or not included in the record in the event that they're questioned about the record during litigation. So Molly, I was curious, do, does the contractor have a role when we're um, responding to appeals or in litigation? It's a good question. And uh, in short, typically no, although there can be exceptions. But let's look at this closer. Roles, responsibilities, and expectations concerning contractor involvement in appeal or litigation response should be spelled out in a statement of work. But more often than not, our statements of work typically defer on this point, and that's okay because we rarely plan to be challenged or sued. So most of the time, when we bring a contractor in to support the BLM's response to an appeal or litigation, 
we pursue a contract modification, which Cindy and Chris discussed in the second broadcast. For all contracted NEPA planning projects, the contract should state that the contractor is to protect and hold confidential any pre-decisional, deliberative, or attorney-client privileged materials that they may come across during the life of a project. And they may need to be reminded of this obligation when difficult or controversial decisions are being considered, and even during litigation. Now it's possible that a plaintiff litigant will approach a contractor and try to obtain information from them to use in litigation against the United States government. But hopefully you'll have a relationship with the contractor such that they would let you know of any such attempts. However, if the contractor appears to be giving up privileged information to a third party, you should notify a solicitor immediately and you should probably make a note that that's probably a contractor with whom we shouldn't pursue work in the future. So beyond stating the importance of protecting all of the rele relevant privileges in your contract, let's talk about the contractor's actual responsibilities in the event that we're sued or appealed. Ideally, the contractor delivers the record to the BLM, then a decision is signed and the record is considered closed. Generally speaking, at that point, the contractor is under no further obligation beyond their delivery of a complete and adequate project record to BLM unless, of course, you've specified otherwise in your contract. Now, the statute of limitations on litigation brought under the Administrative Procedure Act is six years. Therefore, it's unlikely that a contractor will still be under agreement with us at the time of litigation. And as we've said, Administrative Procedure Act litigation is based solely on the administrative record, so nobody's going to subpoena the contractor or even BLM employees for that matter. So other than preparing the complete project record before a decision is signed, which we would then develop into an administrative record at the time of legal challenge, the contractor does not generally have a role in litigation. If you are sued, which as we said could occur up to six years after the decision, you could go back to the contractor to see if they have any additional documents that they may have forgotten to include in the original project record. And you could perhaps hire them back on temporarily to assist in revising or reorganizing the record. But practically speaking, this would be extraordinarily challenging for a couple of reasons. First and most notably, staff turnover. Particularly if the decision is several years old, you may need your old contractor's help to make sense of the project record. But given both BLM and private sector turnover rates these days, how practical is this really? it's highly likely that neither the BLM staff nor the contractor staff would be the same, such that any staff on board would actually have the historical knowledge of the project or the ability to locate obscure records from years ago. Second, it's also possible that you'll not find out until you're sued that the contractor did a less than perfect job of putting documents together into an adequate record. And while you could go back to the contractor, and try to hold them to the terms of their original contract that they put that record together in a cogent fashion, it's, it's a challenging process. Post hoc and after the fact construction of records is generally prohibited and beyond that it may even invite legal arguments over the record itself. And lastly, not to mention it's incredibly frustrating. So the best advice that we can offer on this point is that if a challenge or litigation is imminent, or even likely, it's best to do the work up front. And hopefully this underscores the takeaway messages of the first two broadcasts to be explicit in your statement of work about what you need to see in the record and how it's maintained, and to communicate regularly with the contractor on this point. If you haven't accounted for contractor support in appeal or litigation response in your statement of work, but you would like for the contractor to provide this service, then you'll need to consider a contract modification. And similarly, although we haven't touched much on it in these broadcasts, if you're contracting a large project, an EIS for example, and you receive a large Freedom of Information Act or FOIA request, you may want or need the contractor's support and assistance in filling that FOIA request, particularly if they're the ones handling or managing the records that are being requested. And in this case, again like the previous scenario, you'll need to consider a contract modification if it hasn't already been spelled out in your statement of work. 
Okay, so let's review the roles again for an administrative record. Um, the contractor typically develops a process to manage and categorize the documents and, and the index. They compile and, and maintain the record, and then they deliver the final record to the BLM. Mm -hmm. And then the BLM is ultimately responsible for the record, so it's our role to set and communicate the expectations, of course, in the statement of work. It's our role to do periodic quality control checks, to compile our own internal documents, and to make sure the record is complete before the decision is signed, and then finally to certify the record before it goes to court. Then the solicitor's role is to help organize the record, give advice, and review for privileged documents. Now the contractor's role in supporting legal challenge, <clears throat> of course their role needs to be <clears throat> excuse me, described in the statement of work, and their primary role is to craft an excellent record. And then beyond that, they must protect the privileged documents. And if we need their help to make sense of the record or respond to a FOIA request, it will require a contract modification, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so Molly, what best practices or what kind of tips can you share with the audience about managing the project record on projects that are contracted? Sure, so these will sound similar to, to some of the tips that we offered in the first and second broadcast, but here's a handful of suggestions and best practices for you to consider when developing a project record when you have a contractor involved. First of all, what are our internal expectations? It's important that we identify and agree on these as a team and that we then clearly articulate these expectations in our requests for proposals, our statements of work, and in our startup meetings with the contractor. Secondly, check with your regional solicitor's office for current format requirements for administrative records delivered both to the IBLA as well as to the courts. For example, it's a best practice to have both a hard copy and an electronic copy of all records. In an appeal situation, right now IBLA is wanting a hard copy of all records, whereas in the case of litigation, the courts are typically preferring to have the record electronically. So having the records available in both formats ultimately gives us the greatest flexibility at the end of the contract. Third, work with the contractor to develop a schema or a framework of categories for the administrative record up front. Fourth, define your communications protocol with the record in mind. Anticipate how you'll need to direct traffic on communications, correspondence, and deliverables to best expedite the compilation of records into the overall project record. And because the statute of limitations is six years under APA, as we've said, you may have to re revisit records that haven't been touched in years, maybe even for projects that were completed before you were even on board in your office. In these cases, wouldn't you want the record to be organized in an intuitive, logical fashion? Think about this as you organize your files moving forward as well as the records index. And lastly, consider including a README file. Ask the contractor to write up a memo about how they organize the files. A README file or a how this record is organized memo to accompany the final hard copy record or the electronic version can be really useful. Actually, I'm gonna sneak in one more tip. Periodically check in with the contractor, possibly even asked to review the record at regular intervals. And I've mentioned this in the last couple of broadcasts, but for example, I like to know that the record is current within one month's time. And I'll often ask to see a printout of the index of records at the end of the month or concurrent with each invoice. Or you could even consider asking to see a printout of the records index at the end of each major task. The main takeaway message for you regarding the various project record responsibilities including responsibilities in appeal or litigation scenarios is this. The contractor should deliver a complete and organized record to the BLM just before a decision is signed. It is then the BLM's responsibility to ensure the ad adequacy and thoroughness of that record before that decision is reached. This means being engaged with the record's development all along the way, as well as reviewing and accepting the final record deliverable before the decision. Now once we make that decision, that decision is ours alone. And in that sense, contractors have a pretty limited role in any follow-on appeals or litigation. So if you need or expect additional support from your contractor, 
in an appeal or litigation scenario, make sure the specific tasks, types of assistance, or other work products are clearly spelled out in a statement of work or contract modification. Ultimately, and I'm sure you've heard this, our decisions are only as solid as the records supporting them. So make sure that you, your team, and your contractor are confident in your project record. Okay, so I'd like to highlight a couple of the best practices for developing a project record or administrative record. So one of the most important things is I think we need to figure out what we want <clears throat> and put these expectations as well as the communication protocols in the statement of work. And then <clears throat> checking in frequently with the solicitor and the contractor. And one of the ones that I really like is the developing the README file that explains the organization of the record. I think that probably will go a long way. And making sure the record is complete before the decision is signed. <clears throat> 